What has changed since Queen Elizabeth II passed away? Well, it might seem like the royal family has fallen into chaos, but behind the scenes, there's a super detailed plan in place that needs to be followed to a T. In fact, certain events have already started to unfold with clockwork precision. What do you think is going to happen? Hey, I'm your host, Bridget Shields, and let's jump right into it. First of all, Prince Charles is now the king. Although there are plenty of rituals and ceremonies that he has to go through, he did not actually need any of that to become king. It happened immediately after the Queen's passing. The very first visitor to King Charles has to be the current Prime Minister Liz Truss. And in order to ensure a smooth transition to the new official head of state, all members of parliament need to gather to swear allegiance to the new king. On the first full day of his reign, despite losing his mother the day before, Charles leapt into his new duties. He personally greeted many dozens of members of the public and delivered a televised address to the nation. The next day, government figures proclaimed his accession to the throne at St. James's Palace. Now the line of succession has also changed. After his father's coronation, Prince William will assume the title Prince of Wales in a separate ceremony, which is a title traditionally given to the next in line to the throne. This would make Kate Middleton the Princess of Wales. So now William and Kate's children are also closer to the throne. George has become second in line, Charlotte is third, and little Louis is fourth in line, with Prince Harry still technically below them in fifth place to the throne. Interestingly enough, the original law stated that that younger male heirs would be considered for the throne before their older female siblings. However, in 2013, this changed and now any older female sibling born after the 28th of October 2011 can be considered first for the throne. So because Princess Charlotte was born in 2015, she gets to keep her place in line. Although it didn't always seem likely, Camilla has officially been named Queen Consort. It's generally because she's been married to Charles for quite some time before he ascended the throne, and her popularity has also grown over the years. Years. But why was it thought that she'd never be named queen in the first place? Well, it has a lot to do with her choice of title. Technically, when Charles was the Prince of Wales, she was entitled to be called the Princess of Wales. But because that was Princess Diana's title, she instead chose to use the Duchess of Cornwall out of respect for her memory. So based on the fact that she chose to keep the lesser title, there was speculation at the time of her marriage that she might be called Princess Consort instead of Queen when Charles becomes king. Although to anyone who is unaware of the history between Charles, Camilla, and Princess Diana, I couldn't recommend enough that you look into it and find out why Camilla was so unpopular in the first place. With his position solidified, King Charles III has to get to work even before his mother's funeral. After a short period of grieving and official condolences for the family, the new king will embark on a tour of the UK prior to the funeral, visiting Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. He will meet with leaders and attend services, as well as go out and meet the people. Although it seems like a very difficult task to anyone, especially considering that he would still be grieving, Charles has been training for this moment his whole life, so he's going to be well prepared. Not only that, but going to meet his subjects will be very good for his image, as he will really need to do the work to encourage positive feelings among the public about his new position. Because the truth is that many Brits still doubt that he will be a good king. One of the main arguments is that he simply just doesn't possess the charm and warmth that Princess Diana had. He comes across as aloof, and the New Yorker once described him as a snob. In general, it's thought that he just never really tried to relate to ordinary people. While Prince William, on the other hand, has reached out to people just as much as his mother did and is thought to be a much more compassionate person. But a lot of people prefer to have a bit more of a positive outlook when it comes to Charles's reign. Despite what his reputation suggests, it's entirely possible that he will rise to the occasion and he just needs time to prove himself in his new role. What the heck is happening with Queen Elizabeth II right now? I'm Adam Andrews with Inform Overload and we're going to talk about it. But Buckingham Palace has said that Queen Elizabeth II is under medical supervision as doctors are quote concerned for Her Majesty's health. The palace says the Queen is comfortable and remains at Balmoral Castle in Scotland where she has spent the summer. The statements may have been vague on details, but the fact that they were issued at all speaks volumes as the palace typically only provides very minimal information about the Queen's health. Buckingham Palace announced to the press via email at 12.32pm London time that the Queen was not not well and her doctors were quote concerned. The announcement about the Queen's health came a day after the 96 year old monarch cancelled a meeting of her Privy Council and was told to rest. The Privy Council, a group of the monarch's senior advisors, was due to formally swear in Prime Minister Liz Truss and her new cabinet members at Wednesday's meeting. The session will be held at a later date though. In addition, Her Majesty has been increasingly handing over duties to Charles and other members of the royal family in recent months as she has struggled 
able to get around. Prince Charles, the heir to the throne, along with his wife Camilla and sister Princess Anne, are already with the Queen at Balmoral Castle. Prince William, Charles' eldest son, is also on his way to Balmoral, as is his brother Prince Harry, alongside his wife Meghan, Prince Andrew, and the Earl and Countess of Wessex. Prince William's wife Catherine remained at Windsor as her children, Princes George and Louis, and Princess Charlotte are on their first full day at their new school. Britain's Prime Minister Liz Truss said on Twitter that the whole country is deeply concerned about Queen Elizabeth's health. Her tweet read, My thoughts and the thoughts of people across our United Kingdom are with Her Majesty the Queen and her family at this time. Now the last the public saw of the Queen before this update were images taken on Tuesday that showed her dressed in a sensible grey cardigan and a plaid skirt, on her feet standing before a roaring fire with a cane gripped in one hand and beaming a smile towards the camera. Queen Elizabeth II has passed away at 96 years old at Balmoral Castle after doctors became concerned about her health. Her family is traveling to Scotland to be by her side, but the health of the monarch has been a concern for a while, and as such, Britain has long prepared for this. The palace's secret plan for what happens in the days after the Queen's death is codenamed London Bridge, and it became not so secret after it was leaked to various media outlets. The documents contain granular detail for what happens over the next 10 days leading up to the Queen's funeral. The documents show the extraordinary level of action required by all arms of the British state, including a vast security operation to manage unprecedented crowds and travel chaos that could see, in the words of one official memo, London becoming full for the first time ever. They reveal plans for the Prime Minister and his cabinet to meet the Queen's coffin at St Pancras Station, and for the new King Charles to embark on a tour of the UK in the days before the funeral. In the hours after the Queen's passing, a call cascade will take place informing the Prime Minister, the Cabinet Secretary, which is Britain's highest ranking civil servant, and a number of the most senior ministers and officials. The PM will be informed by the Queen's private secretary, who will also tell the Privy Council office, which coordinates government work on behalf of the monarch. The royal household will then issue an official notification delivering the news to the public. Ministers and senior civil servants will also receive an email from the cabinet secretary, a draft of which reads, Dear colleagues, it is with sadness that I write to inform you of the death of Her Majesty the Queen. This email will also prompt flags across Whitehall to be lowered to half-mast, with them aiming to do this within 10 minutes. The UK Parliament and the devolved legislators in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland will adjourn, and if Parliament is not sitting, it will be recalled. A lot of the immediate plans after the Queen's passing relate to social media. The Royal Family's website changed to a black holding page with a short statement confirming the Queen's death. The UK government website, gov.uk, will display a black banner at the top. All government departments social media pages will also show a black banner and change their profile pictures to their department's crest. Non-urgent content will not be published and retweets are completely banned unless cleared by the central government head of communications. The Prime Minister will be the first member of the government to make a statement, with all other members of the government being instructed not to comment until after the Prime Minister has spoken. Then the Ministry of Defense will arrange for gun salutes to take place at all saluting stations. The plan even details that at 10 a.m on the day after the Queen's death, the Accession Council meets at St. James Palace to proclaim King Charles the new sovereign. Hundreds of Privy Councillors, including the Prime Minister and senior ministers, will be asked to attend. The proclamation will then be read at St. James's Palace and the Royal Exchange in the City of London, confirming that Charles will be the new King. At 3.30pm, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet will hold an audience with the new King, and at 6pm, King Charles will deliver a broadcast to the nation. Simultaneously, there will be a service of remembrance at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. The Prime Minister and a small number of senior ministers will go to that. On the second day following her passing, the Queen's coffin will return to Buckingham Palace. On day four, a rehearsal will take place for Operation Lion, which is the procession of the coffin from Buckingham Palace to the Palace of Westminster, which will take place on the fifth day. The plan covers literally all business and preparation for the next five days, culminating with the Queen's funeral, which is expected to be held on the day 10. The state funeral itself will be held at Westminster Abbey. There will be a two minute silence across the nation at midday, and processions will take place in London and Windsor. There will be a committal service in St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, and the Queen will be buried in the castle's King George IV Memorial Chapel. The Queen has been planning for her succession for some time. The 73 year old Charles 
Charles, who has spent the longest time as king in waiting in British history, has been increasingly stepping in for the Queen. He delivered the ceremonial state opening of Parliament in May, the opening of the Commonwealth Games in August, and the COP26 climate conference last fall. Earlier this year, on the 70th anniversary of her ascension to the British throne, the Queen said that she wanted Camilla to be known as Queen Consort when Charles does become king. Now, if you guys want to check out the London Bridge plan for yourself, it is widely available to the public and it goes into very fine detail about each day following the event of Queen Elizabeth II's passing. Secrets, 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 huh? Since the uh, Queen's passing, unfortunately. I feel like I've heard more tea spilt in the last couple days than my whole life with the royals. Yeah, lots of deep dark secrets in that bloodline. Apparently even a secret letter written by Queen Elizabeth II herself that is locked inside a vault in Australia. I know what you're thinking. What's so special about a letter? It can't be open for 63 years. The letter is inside a vault of a historic building in Sydney and was written by her in November 1986. It's addressed to the people of Sydney, adding that nobody, not even the Queen's personal staff, shall be aware of what the contents of the letter may behold as it has remained hidden, locked away inside a glass case in a royally secure location. One thing's for sure, it mustn't be opened until 2085. So hold on, 63 years of waiting, but it's actually more like 100 years of waiting? Knowing she wouldn't be around or alive for the results and reactions to said secret? Not letting us see some truth until their days are gone? That's risky and fishy. Of course, it's addressed to the Lord Mayor of Sydney. Of course, again, no clue who that's exactly gonna be yet, or even if they've been born yet. We got some time. The Queen's instructions read, on a suitable day to be selected by you in the year 2085 AD, would you please open this envelope and convey to the citizens of Sydney my message to them. It is simply signed, Elizabeth R. Yeah, that's kinda creepy. I hope it's not like, ah oh yes, Australia, my favorite animals was the kangaroo. I kinda want it to be more like, in 1345, we found bodies in a spaceship. You know what I mean? Like, just something fun, and also a little bit scary. According to those in Australia, even the handlers of said piece are unaware of the contents of the letter. Elizabeth, who became queen in 1952, visited Australia 16 times. For the first time, just two years after she was crowned, by then she was 27. She's the first reigning monarch to visit Australia. Woohoo, I feel like that's, that's, that's an accomplishment. It was estimated that about one million people turned out to see her at Sydney. Presently, British monarchy remains Australia's head of state with King Charles III inheriting the role following the death of his mother. A failed 1999 referendum saw Australia's vote to retain the queen as their head of state. To mark the 25th anniversary of the Australian Republic movement, then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull declared that Australia is a country of Elizabethans. When she opened the Sydney Opera House during her fourth visit in 1973, an estimated one million people were there to see her. Her 16th and final visit to Australia was in 2011, on a visit to Brisbane. She traveled along the river on a ferry and was cheered on by thousands of people. Her trip was considered the farewell tour as many knew it was likely to be her last and final visit. Rest in peace.